on several counts it is worth mentioning the contributions of sri km mani to the state and to the society i do firmly believe it is our collective and social responsibility to keep glowing the light that sri km mani has lit in fact sri km mani is a history textbook that needs detailed study due to the time restriction i am constrained to cut short the introductory reference sri km mani was the founder of public policy research institute with the goal of providing theoretically informed and empirically tested information and data to the better governance i bow before the memory of uh, sri km mani the founding chairman of public policy research institute sri tachi tarur ji our eminent speaker needs no introduction before the academic intellectual and political community he is a holy morphic personality a diplomat academician writer parliamentarian philosopher and social worker he represents tiruvannamalai parliamentary constituency since 2009 and president of the professional congress dr sashi tharu served as the minister for external affairs and the human resource development he received the sahitya academy award for his book and era of darkness he authored over 19 best selling books and hundreds of columns and articles in international publications but beyond all adjectives and achievements i like to address him as the world citizen i am cutting short my introductory reference for the paucity of time we are very much obliged to dr tarur ji for making himself available for this lecture despite his busy schedules and uh, talk on the most relevant topic of the time development options of kerala in the post covid era may i once again welcome all of you to the august pro presentation of dr tarur ji thank you very much so i really want to uh, thank dr jess jacob the jacob the ex officio secretary and director of the public policy research institute of trivandrum my good friend jos k mani uh mr joy abraham xmp shri ps shri kumar registrar and many others for uh, their presence today and uh, and above all to say to friends that it's a great honor for me to deliver the care money memorial lecture and in so doing to uh, have the honor of paying tribute to a giant of kerala politics and administration <coughs> so, shri care money was a mentor and a friend to many of us uh, in this group today he was instrumental in establishing the public policy research institute and remained its chairman until his untimely demise in april last year so i feel particularly moved that you have asked me to deliver the first km mani memorial lecture i can say without hesitation there have been very few leaders in the history of kerala like the great uh, and late sri mani we are all aware of his meteoric rise from a humble background where he started off as a young advocate on a path that eventually saw him emerge as one of the most successful leaders of our state he was truly a giant who strode the politics of kerala like a colossus whose records as the longest serving member of the kerala assembly the most successful finance minister in the state who presented budgets from 1969 onwards for nearly half a century more than any other finance minister in the country by far and his undefeated track record from the constituency of pala speak volumes about his inimitable capacity to understand and cater to the aspirations of the keralite electorate i had the great pleasure of reading his highly original contribution the theory of the toiling class which went farther than others in articulating a political philosophy anchored in the economic problems of a section of society whom others were not speaking up for the toiling class of the chaya kadakaran the vegetable or fruit vendor the delivery boy the istri wala this was the toiling class and we had an opportunity through shri mani to understand the importance of articulating their needs though not a trained economist or a management graduate here mani had a formidable reputation as a masterful administrator and problem solver whose approach to matters of revenue and economic affairs have been regarded as models well worth emulating 
I'm sure he would have been glad and appreciated the fact that this lecture named after him, uh, that the first version of it has been centered on a theme that is indispensable to the welfare of the people of our state. And due to the short amount of time that we have, let us delve straight into uh, the, uh, the topic today that you have given me, development options for Kerala in the post-COVID COVID era. And once again, let me request the administrator, please mute other mics. I'm hearing a phone ringing somewhere else. It is very distracting. I beg the administrator, please mute everyone else. Thank you. Now, understanding our past to know our future is a key start if, I, if we're going to have a short and focused talk. The importance of, uh, of uh, jumping into what the future holds for us cannot be underestimated, but we should briefly understand the foundations of the Kerala development model, because as I've remarked in a different context, if you don't know where you're coming from, how will you know where you are going? A few years ago, I, I found myself amongst uh, a large number of management experts and policy makers in Tiruvananthapuram, inaugurating a conversation, a conference, in fact, of the Trivandrum Management Association. And their theme was energizing Kerala. I was intrigued and curious that so many experts and managers and the TMA seem to agree that Kerala is in need of energizing. But that is odd because the only place in the world where Keralites seem to need energizing is Kerala. Look around the planet and you see Keralites everywhere working extremely hard, whether as construction workers or businessmen in the Gulf or teachers in Africa or doctors in the United States or nurses in Europe, displaying their entrepreneurial energies um, really um, and achieving remarkable success. So what is our problem here? Um, I would say that there is very little doubt, sadly, that um, while there is much to be proud about Kerala and about Keralites, Kerala's historic pluralism, its rich tradition of democratic convictions, literacy, socioeconomic development, we do not have a great record of energetic economic development or entrepreneurship in the state. We must be conscious of the limitations um, and the deep-rooted, sometimes hidden problems that affect our whole state. Uh, for example, while we may be regarded as God's own country for our tourists, we also have the unfortunate tag of being the devil's own backyard for businessmen. It's a label that is reflected in the precarious state of our economy. For example, the state is currently ranked 21 amongst all states in the country and the worst in southern India in the 2008 Ease of Doing Business ranking that was jointly conducted by the World Bank and the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion uh, in New Delhi. When it looks at unemployment, our unemployment rate is 9.43%, whereas the national average before COVID, as of 2019, was 6.1%. To put this figure in context, only Tripura and Sikkim had a higher unemployment rate in the whole country. Strikingly, unemployment afflicts primarily the educated and the skilled in Kerala. There has also been an influx of migrant labor from far off states, which has reached critical levels or had reached before COVID, with the numbers touching 32 lakh to fill unskilled jobs that locals, even when otherwise unemployed, just did not want to do. The main drivers of economic growth in our state have been the service and construction sectors which have together contributed 81% to Kerala's net state domestic product. However, this also means that the contributions of industry and, agric and agriculture to the state's income growth have been negligible. This leaves us over, over relying on hospitality and tourism, two sectors which have been pulverized by COVID-19. Debt ratio. If you look at this, um, Kerala staggers under a debt ratio of nearly 30%, one of the highest in the country and the highest in South India. And it's obviously difficult to sustain it in the long run, given the ever-increasing expenditure by the state government and the lack of steady revenues, which has been exacerbated by the central government's inability to pay the state share, our share of the revenue from GST, our situation is likely to worsen significantly. 
And then there is the over-dependence on remittances. I'm sure all of you know this very well because we are all seeing it firsthand, record levels of over-dependence on remittances, uh, particularly from the 2.2 million Keralites in the Gulf, as well as others located in the US, Europe, Africa, and so on. Cumulatively, Kerala gets 85,000 crores annually, and this has been propping up the state's economy. But what happens if in the post-COVID world, this disappears? Now, the impact of COVID-19 on this development model has to be looked at very seriously, because if our economy was in a precarious state before the virus came, the situation is only likely to get worse now. Uh, remittances, there were omin ominous warning signs offered by the World Bank have suggested that global remittances could plummet by as much as 20% in 2020, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, to put that figure in context, during the 2009 global financial crisis, the most severe shock to the world economy before the virus, the fall in remittances globally, according to the same World Bank, was only 5%. So we're going to be four times worse than the worst we've known so far. As a significant number of individuals will be forced to leave their jobs in the Gulf and return to the state, the impact on our economy will not be understated. For example, remittances from the UAE alone, where the largest population of Keralites reside, are expected to fall by 35% in the second quarter of the financial year. As the Gulf oil supply begins to dry, and localization problems begin to take root, we have another major challenge. Uh, Omanization is already costing a lot of Malayalis jobs in Oman. Saudiization and the Nitakat problem is one that we were familiar with earlier. Even when the pandemic finally leaves us, we're looking at a real situation where many of the jobs that were previously readily available to Keralites may no longer exist or be available to foreigners. There was a, a survey many of you must have seen by the Kerala State Planning Board, a quick assessment of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown on Kerala's economy. They have said it's not just remittances we need to be worried about. The hit will be faced by all quarters of our economy. This uh, survey said that the state could face an immediate loss of 80,000 crores as a result of the impact of the virus on the lockdowns, daily wage losses, 14 to 15,000 crores, agriculture, 1,600 crores, fisheries, 1,370 crores, tourism, 20,000 crores, and result, therefore, in a job loss of 26,000 direct job losses and 80,000 indirect job losses or a lack of jobs. This is the Kerala State Planning Board, which has every incentive to give you um, not terribly pessimistic figures, even try and soften the blow so the government doesn't look bad. If that's what they're saying, the reality may even be worse. So what should be our strategy for the post-COVID Kerala, which uh, would be the, the last section of my talk? The fact is that business as usual will not be possible. We will not be able to recover from such a substantial setback uh, because of the deep-rooted problems in our economy unless we completely rethink the way in which Kerala must develop. And I would have four major suggestions. They won't all be easy to implement, but that's where I hope that particularly our, our politics with the state assembly elections coming up next year will grapple these issues very seriously. One, develop a strong industrial and agrarian base. Concerted efforts have to be made to rectify our overlooking the importance of these things. Over time, the absence of a strong industrial foundation and dependence on other states for our agricultural produce has ensured that our economy has remained vulnerable to global shocks like COVID. That will have to change. The government will have to establish the conditions that will attract investment in our industrial capacity. Kerala has clean air, lush environment, uh, literate workforce. We have a clear potential to bring in investors and companies that are seeking to leave behind the polluted metros and the existing industrial centers find new uh, tier two cities to set up shop. The fact is that um, we must tap into this by officially offering incentives, uh, streamlining permissions, removing, uh, removing the rampant red tapism, um, so that these investors have the confidence to pump resources into our state. 
I know it won't be easy because our politics is a major burden. I remember during my brief period between leaving the United Nations and coming into Indian politics, I was actually working as a consultant for a company based in the Gulf that was trying to promote investments in Kerala. And I spoke to at least 50 or 60 prominent Marinal and Malayalis and told them, why can't you invest in our state? And the answer uniformly of over 90% of them was, we love Kerala, we care for Kerala, but if we try and set up an industry in Kerala, the red, red flags will show up and we will not be able to do any work. We would rather get Keralaite workers to work for us just across the border in Tamil Nadu. And that is the kind of conversation I kept having. One of the things that brought me into politics was my frustration at that realization. And at the same time, we have to have a cultural change in our, not just our politics, but in our own attitudes. Uh, take the scourge of our culture of hartals, a chronic issue that torments the state on a staggeringly frequent basis. The Madhurumi estimated that in the first six months of 2018 alone, the state had 64 hartals. That's one hartal every three days at some part of the state or sometimes in the whole state. And this in turn costs the state nearly 2,000 crores annually and far more in terms of indirect costs. No other state has to suffer this crippling self-imposed burden and handicap. Several people have told me the story of how once BMW had been persuaded by Uman Chandi's government to install a car manufacturing plant in the state, thanks to generous concessions. Um, but uh, the very day that the BMW executives arrived from Germany in Kerala to sign the deal, they were greeted by a bund. The state had shut down over some marginal political issue. Cars were being blocked on the streets. Shops were closed. The CPM was out in strength. It had nothing to do with BMW or with foreign investment, but the executives apparently beat a hasty retreat and set up their plant in neighboring Tamil Nadu instead. So my strong view, which I've been advocating within the UDF for many years, is that all parties without exception must swear to forego hartals as a protest tactic for any reason. Better still, I think the assembly should pass a law banning hartals with severe fines for violators. That's a strong personal conviction. Number three, we should diversify, but at the same time play to our core strengths. There is at a time of great global shock and change, how our economy adapts is vital and a conscious effort to diversify will dictate the future of our economy. So two examples that come to my mind are number one, the services sector, because educated Keralites have the capacity to come together and develop a world-class services sector. We've already seen it to a certain extent through the rise of dedicated IT parks in the state. Um, but we can't interpret services only to be Ayurvedic massage and, 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 and you know, yoga. That's wonderful, but there's a limit to how much that can be done. We need, for example, to develop more IT, including uh, uh, Trivandrum's Technopark, since you are a Trivandrum-based institute. Let me say that uh, it's really established itself well, but it can grow potentially. It's a great area of strength offering tremendous potential for employment and revenue generation, and we must continue to tap into it. I've personally been involved in pushing national and international firms to come to the Technopark, which is of course the oldest in the country, and yet the least global in terms of its composition. Uh, HCL and Oracle acceded to my request. We're pursuing actively getting others like Tech Mahindra to consider our pitch. Not even the left disputes that IT is perhaps the most important area for Kerala's future growth and development. Yet despite the availability of educated young people, relatively low operational costs, and a congenial working environment, Kerala has failed to break into the big league because of our failure to attract the major global companies to set up shop in our state, and we must do more of that. Uh, and a, another second example in, in diversification is making a real effort to develop a knowledge society. As we have seen in states like Haryana and, and Rajasthan, top educational institutions that are fed up with the cramped space in major cities and the deb debilitating environmental conditions want to look towards other states to establish premier world-class institutions. With the right kind of mindset and planning and some cooperation from the state government, Kerala is the best place to be the educational hub of India. Uh, we have great results in education, starting with primary education. We can do the same to higher education. Um, the whole higher education system in India has been plagued by a weak research ecosystem, inadequate faculties, subpar promotion of innovation, and general lack of world-class facilities. 
to cater to our ever-growing youthful demographic. So we could actually transform that and rise to that challenge by consciously building on our existing educational infrastructure, developing a cluster of world-class knowledge institutions. That requires some incentives from the state when it comes, for example, to land acquisition. But education institutions love being surrounded by greenery, clean air, a good environment. Let's convert our industrial failure into success and attracting universities. Let's become the greater Boston or the, or the, 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 the Raleigh-Durham Triangle that the Americans like boasting about, where a whole bunch of quality universities congregate in one area. We can have the incipient capacity uh, to create a research ecosystem in Trivandrum. We have the Rajiv Gandhi Biotechnology Center. We have the Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute. We have the Tuba Crops Research Institute. We have the Center for the Development of Telematics. Now, why do I say we need more? When the Kerala political instinct, and I'm smiling at Joe's uh, K. Money sitting there, the Kerala political instinct is to say, oh, we have put one thing in uh, Kerala, I mean, in Trivandrum, the next one must be in Kodukod, the third one must be in Tolupuya, the fourth one must be in Kotayam, and at the end result, there is no ecosystem anywhere. Whereas scientists, educators, learners, researchers like to be able to meet each other, interact, share information, even socialize together. This is what the Americans have learned, the Europeans have learned, but we in India have not learned. To create a knowledge city is far more important than dispersing knowledge institutions around the country. And you'll get world-class talent coming to a place where there is a research ecosystem to an isolated institution here and there. And this is why I was, for example, not in favor of putting the uh, Central University in Kasargod, where no one goes, whereas if it had been put in a place like Trivandrum or Kochi, you would have had world-class faculty uh, and top, top quality students from around the country coming there. This importance of focusing on a knowledge ecosystem is very important. But at the same time, we should realize that a knowledge economy will not employ all Carolites. We need to improve our agriculture too particularly cereal, vegetable, and fruit production, including for export, as well as dairy. And we have to be able to, to go beyond construction of houses for Gulf Malayalis, especially if the Gulf Malayalis are not sending back money to build houses. One important area as a coastal MP, let me say, is to promote ancillary industries like fisheries. Even as we diversify, we must support fisheries, the fisheries sector with the right technological advancements, processing units, and so on, to be a vital engine for our economy uh, because they have become a marginalized, impoverished section of our society at a time when they could very easily be a growth engine, particularly the export sector. Uh, I'm not giving up on tourism and hospitality. It's bound to come back after COVID. It is a key revenue earner for Kerala, will again be there after COVID. And we must, of course, uh, strengthen the sector strategically in a manner that attracts even larger footfalls while at the same time catering to our growing unemployment problem. One of the good things about tourism and hospitality is that it absorbs a lot of labor, including semi-skilled and unskilled labor. You don't need very high quality uh, skills to be a doorman or a gardener's assistant or a waiter or a busboy. And to do that, uh, we need to absolutely uh, uh, expand our tourism footprint. Several credible studies have conclusively proved that in India, the potential of tourism and being a wellness destination, thanks to the strengths of Ayurveda and other natural healing techniques in Kerala, is immense. Um, we actually um, have missed the bus for things like industry to places like Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, but tourism can still grow because the studies show that $1,000 invested in tourism can generate eight times the number of jobs as $1,000 invested in manufacturing. The tourism industry can do a great deal for us and I hope the government will come up with an enlightened policy to save those uh, hotels, institutions, um, and, and, and uh, tourism-related industries that are in danger of literally going bankrupt and going under during this COVID disaster period. If we can save them through a safety net and support them to become, once again, the growth engine for us. One small note, uh, I wasn't sure when we began whether we would be doing this lecture in Malayalam or in English. But I think we should, in fact, uh, use uh, more widely and more often the language in which I'm addressing you today. It's essential that Keralites improve their proficiency in English. It's the language of global and national commerce and technology, as well as of world literature. And it's essential 
that we Malayalis overcome our reputation for sometimes being incomprehensible in English. Remember, it's everyone's second or third language. You may not learn 20 Indian languages or a dozen world languages, but everyone doing business and, uh, and working with you in today's globalized economy will have some English as a second or third language. And if your English is just that, that good enough to communicate, but you have the confidence and should not be self-conscious when using it, you will be able to actually uh, do much better. And I think this is something that we have to really shake off. Uh, we are proud of Malayalam, proud of the culture, the literature, and the language, but it should not be at the expense of adequate capacity in the English language. I do believe that uh, we are capable of innovative change. Kerala has some remarkable firsts to its achievement, including the first public-private partnership airport from 1994, Nero um, I would really urge that Kerala will succeed if it is open to the contention of ideas and interests, welcomes new ideas, um, changes its political mindset of hartals and negativism, opens up to the creation of a knowledge uh, ecosystem and a knowledge city concept in our state, uh, enhances and supports its tourism and uh, hospitality industries, becomes an IT power hub and reduces its dependence its over dependence on some of the existing drivers of the economy that I've already described. I believe that if we change our attitudes and fulfill and liberate the creative energies of our people, we can actually end this reputation of being the devil's own playground and become the God's own country, not only for tourists, but for every single Keralite as well. Thank you for your attention and Jehan. Sir, questions are there in the chat box. Uh, can you select and give the answers? Oh, all right, they're in the chat box. All right, so first question is uh, from A.B. Matthew in Sydney, um, saying, uh, post-COVID period, are we expecting a change in the global power shift with some of the most developed countries failing to handle the crisis? I think that's a good question, and, and there's no doubt that we're going to see some significant changes uh, in the global power equation. But it's not going to be, um, uh, I think, necessarily easily predictable. For example, if you look at something like, um, like, uh, like China. China has actually managed to antagonize a lot of countries despite its success in being able to deal with COVID. Uh, and so many countries are saying, uh, why we must reduce our dependence on China, we must decouple from China. And that's becoming a very interesting development that we are seeing uh, in many countries. The US has been the most outspoken about it, but others like Australia and, and, and the UK are heading in the same direction. China, meanwhile, is asserting itself belligerently. It's picking fights with Vietnam, with Japan, with India. It's showing that it's not afraid. It's, it's becoming more muscular and it has the money and the resources, especially being the first major developed economy to recover from COVID has given it that extra muscle and strength. So we don't know how it's going to go. China may become a bigger success story and a more dominant power, or people may detach from it and try and restrict its growth. Uh, I have a piece in this issues uh, the week where I talk about the challenge of not containing China, which is what the critics and enemies of China have wanted so far, but rather constraining China, which is to engage with it, but not allow it uh, to, uh, to do damage to us and to others around the world. That's something that I think uh, we can well consider. The U.S.'s future remains uncertain. Under Trump, certainly, they've gone through some bad times. But I would argue that as far as, uh, uh, as, far as, um, as, uh, as, as the U.S. is concerned, we may have a different story after the November elections, and we should probably wait for that to determine. Ultimately, more and more countries are becoming more focused on self-reliance. Atmanir Bharta says Prime Minister Modi, more protectionism is coming up. There is talk of deglobalization, and there is a reduced emphasis on multilateralism. The US has announced it's pulling out of the World Health Organization. Instead of strengthening international responses, we seem to be backing off from them. And this is something that I, I do worry about. Um, so um, that's, that's very, very important. 
the second question I see here is, um, is that uh, what is the role of corruption in retarding the development of Kerala, how to control it, what skills and politicians should be enhanced for this? Look, actually, from what I've seen across India, corruption is a national problem. It is a problem everywhere. And Kerala, uh, this is from Francis Joseph. Uh, Francis, I would say Kerala is actually less affected than many other states. Kerala has a number of positives. We have a very educated public, a vibrant and genuinely free media. We ask questions, we expose scandals, we challenge these things. I would argue that though there may be some corruption, and there is corruption everywhere in India, it is arguably much less than what we're seeing in many other parts of the country. So I would not agree with the implication that that's a major yeah. challenge in impeding the development of Kerala. I love you. Matthew Joseph says, can we have the government coming up with a policy to popularize the futuristic technologies like artificial intelligence? Answer is absolutely yes. This is actually a national requirement, not just for the state. If we want to succeed in this first half of the 21st century, we have to really pile into things like AI and robotics urgently. What's striking is that a significant number of the technologists working in Silicon Valley on artificial intelligence are actually Indians. So why can't we get some of these Indians to work in India on this, and why can't Kerala offer them the perfect environment? Not just Malayalis. Non-Malayalis should want to come to our techno parks, work surrounded by, by greenery and clean air and, and good connections, and be able to focus on developing cutting edge concepts of artificial intelligence and other new technologies. It's very striking. There's a study by the Oxford Martin Center that says by 2030, 30% 30 of the jobs that exist in the world today I'm mean, sorry, that exist in the world at 2030 will be jobs that do not exist in the world today. So how can you prepare to teach, teach people and prepare them for jobs that don't exist? You can't train them. What you can do is tell your teachers, don't teach children what to think, teach children how to think. Give them an opportunity to think out of the box, to think creatively, and they will be in a position, I believe, to deal with this more effectively. MP Joseph is asking about the absence of migrant labor uh, in the next years. After all, many migrant laborers went back. How will it play out vis-a-vis -vis the expected return of large numbers of NRKs from the Gulf? The problem, uh, Joseph Saab, is that the migrant uh, workers coming back from the Gulf may not be prepared to do the same kind of work for Indian wages. Even though Kerala has the highest wages in the country, it's still a fraction of what they were earning in the Gulf. And I don't know. I think we'll have to see sociologically. Will Keralites who were used to getting literally two or three times, maybe even four times the wage for construction labor in the Gulf that they would get for construction labor in Kerala, will they be prepared to do construction work? If you're working in a, as a show, as a as a petty uh, a salesman in a in a shoe shop, which you would consider an undignified profession in Kerala, but there you were earning a white collar salary. You come to Kerala, will you work as a salesman in, in a shoe shop? Those are cultural questions. You are all Malayalis. You can answer them as well as I do. But I have a feeling that uh, many of our migrant laborers who want to come back uh, from Bihar and Orissa and Bengal because they're not going to be finding employment very easy there or elsewhere. Um, MP Joseph also asks, one of the reasons for the low position Kerala has in ease of business is because of the large number of permits and licenses, uh, including labor-related permits, that even a small business has to obtain uh, before starting a business or industry here. Can we have a three-year holiday from taking all licenses and permits for all businesses? Um, I think that would be difficult, but I certainly believe that we should have a formula uh, uh, of, 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 of simplifying all this. Uh, at the very least, we should look at which state is number one in India uh, because many of the compliances that are imposed upon states are also national compliances coming out of national legislation. Uh, but, but don't add any state compliances. Uh, try and get into a minimal permission environment. Uh, and also that goes back to the question that was asked about corruption. The more people have the power to grant you permissions, the more they have incentives uh, to take, uh, shall we say, <clears throat> inducements to grant you that permission. Therefore, the fewer permissions that are involved, the fewer the possibilities for corruption as well. Can I ask you a question? I'm just going through the questions in the chat box. It's whatever the moderator says, I'm happy to do. Tankam Arun says, 
Um, an economic community needs to be supported by a foundation of interacting organizations. Can we address this issue through better infrastructure and technological framework? I agree entirely. No need to discuss. We should definitely do that. Um, um, is it politically right to ban hartals in the present Indian context? I believe, yes. I believe hartals are not only wrong uh, and politically counterproductive, they're also immoral because hartals are not about showing. Gandhiji taught us that when you protest, you show the strength of your own feelings. With hartals, you want to show the strength of your feelings by inconveniencing others, by preventing some old lady from going to a hospital to save her life, by preventing a pregnant lady from delivering, by preventing a student from taking an examination. It is a criminal activity. Hartals, I will never consider justified at any stage ever for any reason. <clears throat> if you feel strongly, you go on a hunger strike. You uh, protest outside the secretariat. You march on half the road without blocking all the traffic on the other half. All that you can do. Our democracy offers hundreds of means of legal peaceful protest. Hartal is a pure method of coercing people who do not wish to be coerced and preventing them leading normal lives. To my mind, it is unacceptable in any circumstances, for any reason, everywhere. Um, Dr. Varghis Pareil says, the tourism sector in Kerala is not developing. What could be the reasons? Um, I, think, I think it's actually developed reasonably well, so I'm not sure I accept the premise of the question, Dr. Varghis, because um, it could develop more, I agree. One of the factors is supposed to be, uh, uh, for example, the entire northern Kerala belt did not develop very well because there's no airport north of Koyukod. That has changed with the arrival of Kannur Airport. Uh, Baikal and other areas should be seeing a tourism boom once tourism, tourism revives. We should certainly uh, expect to see established centers of tourism like Kovalam and, and Kochi and, 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 and other places, the various beaches, particularly Kumarakam and so on. Uh, water bodies and beaches uh, doing very well. We may need a, a, a revived uh, selling point, but I will assure you that um, after Rajasthan and the Taj Mahal, Kerala is very, very high uh, for general tourists. There's, of course, niche tourists, wildlife tourists in Kaziranga or you know, bird sanctuaries like Bharatpur and, and tiger reserves in certain places. That kind of thing, obviously, uh, people go for very specific purposes. But the general tourist who wants to relax, have a good time, uh, enjoy themselves, Kerala is still very high up on the list. Mohan Kumar Sharadama says Kerala has less strikes and lockouts compared to other states. That is simply not true. Look at the statistics. Uh, and Hartals, we are the national leader. Uh, in fact, I think the entire country, in the same year of Madhuram, we found 64 Hartals in six months. The entire rest of the country together had three Hartals or Bans. There is no question, Mohan Kumar, your fact is wrong. Um, and you can check, you can Google all this. Then we have Professor Bernie. Uh, do you think Kerala is heading for a financial crisis? We are already in a financial crisis, Professor Bernie. We're living on borrowed money. And of course, we have not been given money by the state that we are owed to us. Plus, we have very, very few uh, revenue sources. I mean, one of the reasons, for example, that Kerala became the first state to open the liquor shops during the COVID lockdown is that the Kerala government had to subsist on excise revenues from the sale of alcohol. They were not getting tourism money. They were getting a sharply reduced amount of remittances because the remittance Gulf workers and so on were not working. And the hospitality industry was crushed. There's no construction going on during the lockdown. So where is money coming into the state? They had to sell booze. That's how much of a financial crisis we're in. Um, effective waste management. I'm sorry I couldn't mention that. That's uh, Nijo M. Maman. Uh, absolutely, I agree. Effective waste management has to be improved. We have a very, very big area, uh, area of failure in waste management by comparison with many, many cities and, and states in the country. And for a rather urbanized state like Kerala, with so many municipal bodies and so on, it is shameful that we haven't been able to master something so basic. There are innovative technologies available. The Kerala government should make it a priority to allow them into the state, uh, particularly, for example, waste recycling for fuel, or waste recycling for road tarring materials, various things. We could become a leader uh, in the country because we have to really overcome a colossal waste problem. We kind of have the kind of waste of a developed country, uh, but we don't have developed country approaches to disposing of the waste. Good point. Merin Pongan Naga says, I'm, I'm uh, from Nagaland. I have two questions. Um, is the lockdown helping in containing the pandemic or does it create more problems? I think this is a a very interesting dispute that's been going on. 
my friend Tony Thomas, who had brought Nissan to Trivandrum and partially uh, in consultation with me, I might even say principally in consultation with me, um, he says that uh, lockdowns are not necessary. Uh, the transmission of the virus is basically through airborne droplets. So everybody wears masks and avoids very crowded places. You can actually uh, lead a normal life and, con and continue with the normal economic activity. And he makes that case very strongly and very persuasively. He says that's what's happening in Japan. Uh, they have uh, the highest number of cases recorded yesterday was 388 in Japan. Uh, whereas in places in India, with the lockdown, we've got, as we know, uh, over 11 lakh cases. So I think there's a very, very good question here, uh, uh, whether this is uh, true or not. I'm not an epidemiologist. I cannot pretend to be an expert. I'm a public policy person, so it's my job to listen to uh, policy suggestions from everybody. But I do not want to claim to be the authoritative voice on this. I would certainly say that there is some truth to Rajiv Bajaj's famous statement that by the lockdown, we flatten the wrong curve. That is, we flatten the economic curve rather than the uh, virus curve. So there would be an answer uh, to you, uh, uh, Meren Pongan Naga, that, uh, that we knew need to be able to resume economic activity while taking all abundant precautions. Uh, we cannot allow people into crowded places, but otherwise, as much as possible, let them go about their business wearing masks. Um, Dr. Shantakumar says, as a Trishurian, I would say that uh, Tishur has a medical university, an agricultural university, and an animal husbandry college. So think of Tishur as the educational hub. Well, thank you. That's the kind of competition we're very good at in Kerala. Uh, you can have a, a Tishur case, you can have a, a Trivandrum case, you can no doubt have a Kochi case, and so on. I think ultimately Kerala as a whole can be an educational hub for the whole country. And uh, in due course, particularly given scarcity of land and so on, we may have to develop multiple knowledge cities in our state. Sir, sir, John is reminding me to a stop. Yes, it is, it is now uh, late for my next event. I'll take uh, perhaps uh, one last question. Matthews Raju says, due to the difficulties of COVID, our government and institutions are pursuing online education. What is your view of this, uh, of partially adopting online education, even after the pandemic, three days of online classes, three days of offline classes? Well, the short answer to that is that, unfortunately, online education has exposed our digital divide. One of the most heartbreaking stories of the pandemic and the lockdown was that poor Dalit girl, uh, uh, daughter of a daily wage worker, who was coming first in class up to class 12 when the classes went online. Uh, and she not only had no, uh, her family could not afford any online education. She had no mobile phone and her family's only black and white television set had gone for repair and her father without the daily wages because there's no work, could not afford to repair it, she hanged herself. And that was a story that broke the heart of every Malayali and many of us started contributing money to buy at the very least TV sets, if not, uh, if not online packages for uh, poor families. Uh, but this kind of digital divide makes it very difficult to be an enthousi enthusiastic advocate of online education yet. In any case, I've been a bit of a skeptic because number one, in most parts of India, you still do not have 24 seven electricity, including by the way, in a parliamentarian's bungalow in New Delhi, there are daily power cuts. Secondly, uh, uh, the last minute, the last mile connectivity for online broadband is not very impressive. We have some of the slowest broadband speeds in the world in India. And therefore I think, let us first build up our electrical and our online uh, connectivity infrastructure, and then we can talk about it. And then we should also make sure that every student is equipped with the means to access it. It should not become a method of creating an online uh, uh, divide, a digital divide between the poor and the well-off in our society. I will have to stop there. I've taken, I think, a dozen questions already. It was extremely impressive to see the level of interest and the quality of the questions that came in. Many, many thanks to all of you. There are still another dozen questions that have come in, which I've not been able to respond to. Uh, but I think some of the questions cover ground that I've already covered in the speech. So if we are going to put the recording of this talk on social media, I think questions, for example, about agricultural production, about uh, uh, some of these um, uh, issues, uh, you'll find the answers in my talk. And for the rest, 
we may have an opportunity to meet again. So once again, thank you all very much for giving me an opportunity to honor the memory of the great immortal care money uh, by delivering this first lecture and taking your questions on Kerala development after COVID. Thank you, and Jay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, uh, it is now I propose uh, it is a very excellent uh, uh, speech as uh, always we expect from you. Uh, so now I uh, invite uh, Sri Sri Kumar to propose the vote of thanks. Dr. Shashi Tharoor MP, Dr. Jos Jacob, uh, Sri Jos K. Mani and other friends. Uh, really, uh, actually, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Shashi Tharoor with us for this first uh, lecture series uh, conducted by the Public Policy Research Institute in memory of uh, late Sri K. M. Mani, our former finance minister and the founder of this uh, institute. Uh, actually, this uh, the, the, the speech delivered by Dr. Shashi Tharoor is very thought-provoking and uh, in the interest of the Kerala state, it is very fruitful. Perhaps some of you may be remembering that some time back, I, I think it was uh, 10 years back, Dr. APJ Abdul Kala came to Kerala and he delivered a speech in the assembly for the, uh, with his uh, futuristic vision on Kerala. Uh, the, the, the present uh, speech of Dr. Shashi Tharoor is akin, similar to that one made by Dr. APJ Abdulla. We are actually very much thankful to Dr. Shashi Tharoor for sharing his uh, thoughts with uh, all of us, old friends from all over India and from UK, Australia and other uh, countries are there. We are really thankful for, uh, to Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Uh, for coming to this uh, webinar and uh, inaugurating this. We are also thankful to our participants, including Bios K. Mani and other uh, guests, as well as Dr. Uh, Arun from uh, the Professor uh, Essex University, UK, and other so many dignitaries were there. We are really thankful to all of them. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir.